Red Sails to Capri, Chapter 5, A Long Story Without an End. If the Scirocco hadn't started, it might never have happened. But the Scirocco did start, and when the Scirocco blows, people do queer things. A Scirocco is a wind, but not an ordinary wind. It is a wind laden with dust that sends everyone indoors and keeps them there. The days seem endless. Lord Derby stared moodily out of the windows. Monsieur Jacques paced the floor like a caged animal. Only Herr Nordstrom seemed not to mind. He sat in a corner, his head bent over his books. By the second evening, everyone was restless. They sat, the three guests and the three Bacanos, around the big fireplace trying to keep warm. Now and then, someone would try to start a conversation, but it never lasted long. It was hard to compete with the howling wind, which seemed to grow louder every second. Finally, after a particularly long silence, Monsieur Jacques looked up. Signor Pagano, he said, I just happened to think of something. You know, the second day I was here, I went for a sail with Michael and Petro. Yes, Monsieur Jacques, I remember. Michael held tight to the arms of his chair. He knew what was coming. While we were sailing, Monsieur Jacques went on, we passed a little cove. I wanted to drop anchor there and have lunch, but Michael wouldn't let me. He said it was dangerous. But when I asked him in what way it was dangerous, he wouldn't tell me. Finally, he told me to wait and ask you. Signor Pagano shifted uneasily in his chair. It is a long story, Monsieur Jacques and it has no end. Monsieur Jacques laughed. (laughs) It's a long evening, Signor Pagano, and it too seems endless. Perhaps this night and your story were made for each other. The wind howled around the end and beat against the windows. Signor Pagano nodded. Perhaps you are right. If I must answer your question sometime, and I suppose I must, this is a good night to do it. At least we need not fear that someone will hear us. Before I start, I must ask you to promise that you will never repeat anything I tell you this evening. Monsieur Jacques and Lord Derby nodded. Herr Nordstrom nodded too, but no one could tell whether he was nodding over a passage that pleased him in one of his books, or whether he too was willing to promise. Everyone moved a little closer to Signor Pagano, for his voice was low and it was difficult to hear him above the roaring of the wind. First, he began, there are a few facts you must know in order to understand some of the things I'm going to tell you. I believe I have mentioned that Signora Pagano and I are not natives to Capri. We were born in Naples and lived there until we were married 15 years ago. I come from a long line of innkeepers, and when someone told us that Capri had only one inn and was badly in need of another, we decided to come here and open one of our own. The inn was needed, there was no doubt of that, and life should have been easy for us, but it wasn't. Half of Capri is related to Signor Petito, who owns the other inn, and they lined up like an army to protect him. From the minute a tourist got off of the boat, he heard nothing but Signor Petito. Every small boy, every market woman, every sailor on the beach, when asked about a place to stay, would answer, Signor Petito. I was sometimes surprised that they didn't teach the donkeys that carried the luggage to bray it too. Perhaps they tried and couldn't. In any case, Signor Petito's inn had to be so crowded that guests were hanging out of the windows before any happened to land up here. Not that anyone ever mentioned our inn. Unthinkable. But sometimes people happened to wander up here and were pleased to find a place that was quiet and peaceful. Now you must understand, Signor Pagano went on, that all of this didn't happen because the people of Capri disliked us, not at all. But our grandfathers weren't born on Capri. Our fathers weren't born on Capri. And, an unbelievable thing, we ourselves weren't born on Capri. We were foreigners. We had come all the way from Naples, 15 miles across the bay. If we spoke a different language, wore different clothes, ate different food, It could not have been any worse. We were strangers, and what were strangers doing in Capri? 
Today, after 15 years, we have many friends. The people of Capri like us. They are kind and generous, but we are still foreigners. Yesterday, there was a meeting of the men of Capri. The marketplace must be moved, and we were trying to decide where to move it. About halfway through the meeting, I offered a suggestion. Everyone stared at me. What right had I, a foreigner, to tell these natives of Capri what to do? And that, after 15 years. Signor Pagano shook his head. However, he went on, we have made progress. Last summer, a cousin of Signor Petito's recommended our end to a tourist. True, he had had a fight with Signor Petito the night before. But two, three years ago, that would not have made any difference. He would have recommended the end of a cousin he hated long before he would have recommended the end of a foreigner whom he liked. Tears came to Signor Pagano's eyes. Slowly, through the years, we have worked our way into this little island. Today, many have forgotten that we were not born here. I want you to know, Monsieur Jacques, Lord Derby, Herr Nordstrom. Herr Nordstrom looked up from his book, smiled absentmindedly when Signor Pagano mentioned his name, and then went on with his reading. I want you to know it and understand it and accept it. Otherwise, you will not be able to understand the other things I'm going to tell you. Signor Pagano moved a little closer to the fire. Everyone else moved a little closer, too. Everyone, that is, except Herr Nordstrom. He stayed in his corner, his book open on his lap. Shortly after we came to Capri, Signor Pagano went on, an old fisherman, a kind, friendly fellow, asked me to go with him on a trip around the island. I, too, Monsieur Jacques, saw the cove you mentioned, and I, too, thought it looked inviting. But when I mentioned it to my friend, the good saints help us, I thought the boat would turn over with his ravings. Never mention that cove to anyone, he shouted to me. Never, do you understand? Nothing will mark you as a foreigner so quickly. Nothing. If you want to live in peace, forget about the cove. I am your friend, Signor Pagano, he said to me, and I tell you this as a friend. Promise me you'll never mention the cove again. It is bad luck, believe me, the worst of bad luck. I wanted to ask him to explain. A thousand questions came to my mind, but he was so upset and I was so surprised by his sudden outburst that I could think of nothing to say. I shrugged my shoulders and nodded my head. My thought was to calm him. I promise, I kept saying, I promise. My words seemed to quiet him. Good, he said, giving me a friendly pat. You are a smart man, Signor Pagano. You learn quickly. You will go far. But, Signor Pagano went on, my shrugging and my nodding and my smiling were all on the outside. Inside, I was burning with curiosity. What could be so terrible about a peaceful little cove? What had happened there? What might happen? Who could tell me? Many nights I lay awake thinking about it. I would become excited, furious. I would make up my mind first thing in the morning to find out the secret of this silly, impossible, ridiculous, terrible thing. But always in the morning I would remember how my friend had acted when I spoke of the cove. I remembered I had promised not to mention it again. And most of all, I remembered his words. Nothing will mark you as a foreigner so quickly. So always, I was afraid to ask my questions. This went on for years, and then Signor Pagano smiled. Then, well, I suppose I finally did become a native of Capri. For me, the cove ceased to exist. I haven't thought about it for years. It is easy to forget it. I have sat time after time and watched boats make a wide semicircle around it. I've seen sailors and fishermen cross themselves when they pass near it. But in the 15 years I have lived here, I have never heard anyone mention it. Signor Pagano stopped talking, and for a while everyone was silent. Finally, Monsieur Jacques spoke. Signor Pagano, my friends say, if I don't find adventure, adventure will find me. I think your little island has just been waiting for me to come along and discover its secret. Signor Pagano turned pale. Monsieur Jacques, perhaps you have forgotten. 
Before I started my story, I asked you to make a promise. You promised not to repeat anything that was said here tonight. Surely you are a man of your word. I am indeed, Senor Pagano, and I understand perfectly why you have kept silent all these years. I know how important your silence has been to you and your family. But surely I, a total stranger, could ask a few questions without hurting anyone. I, Senor Pagano, stopped him. First, Monsieur Jacques, let me say this. Your questions will do you no good. You can ask questions for a week, for a month, for a year, and you will know no more in the end than you know at this minute. Your questions will be met with icy stares, with a shrug of the shoulders, with a small laugh, an arched eyebrow, and with complete silence. There is something which I suppose I have not made clear. The natives of Capri think it is bad luck even to mention the cove. Why should they run the risk of bringing bad luck on themselves in order to satisfy a stranger? Remember then, your questions will do you no good. And remember this too, your questions will do me almost as much harm as if I had asked them myself. You, as you say, are a stranger here. You've scarcely spoken to anyone except the five of us. What then will happen if you start suddenly to ask questions? I have, as I said, many friends here, but I have some enemies too. Signor Petito, as I have mentioned, is not overly fond of me. What would happen if he should begin asking a few questions himself? Why, he could say, is Signor Pagano's guest so interested in a certain little place on this island? He will not mention the cove, you may be sure but everyone will know what he means. Before long, everyone will be sure that I have put you up to it. A few more questions from Signor Petito, and they will be sure that I brought you all the way from France for this very purpose. First thing you know, they'll be calling you a spy, a foreign spy. The next thing you know, Signor Pagano shrugged his shoulders. As you yourself have said, Monsieur Jacques, there is not much to do in Capri. The evenings are long and the wine is strong. It is easy to put ideas into people's heads when they have nothing else to think about. A little excitement is pleasant and welcome. Everyone adds a bit to the story to make it more interesting. Who knows where it might end? Monsieur Jacques walked back and forth across the room. Finally, he stopped in front of Signor Pagano. It is not easy, he said, to give up a chance for adventure, but perhaps you are right. Once more, everyone was silent. Then, wonderful! The word rang out in the quiet room. A book slammed shut with a heavy clap. Perfect! The book fell to the floor and Herr Nordstrom strode across the room. Unbelievable! Five pairs of eyes stared at Herr Nordstrom. What had happened to him? Where was his shyness, his quietness? Where was his low voice, his dreamy eyes, his absent-minded look? He seemed taller now. His voice rang out full and deep. His cheeks were flushed. Michael, he said, do you remember when you asked me the meaning of philosophy? Yes, Herr Nordstrom. You didn't understand what I told you. No, Herr Nordstrom, I'm afraid I didn't. That worried me, Michael. Worried you, Herr Nordstrom? Yes, for years I've studied philosophy. I was sure I knew a great deal. I was pleased with myself. I thought I was a great scholar, but when you asked me a simple question, I couldn't give you a simple answer that you could understand. Suddenly, I was all tangled up in words. What good, I asked myself, did all my learning do me? I was very unhappy, but now everything is all right again. I have found a way to explain what I meant to you. It is very simple. Herr Nordstrom smiled to himself. Suddenly, Signor Pagano looked happy, too. The evening had not turned out badly, after all. Monsieur Jacques seemed satisfied about the cove, and now here was Herr Nordstrom turning the conversation to something entirely different. Philosophy! Signor Pagano smiled. He knew no more about it than Michael, but he was sure of one thing. It was a nice, safe subject. He hoped they would talk about it the rest of the evening. Come, Herr Nordstrom, Signor Pagano thumped him on the back. Come, tell us about it. We are all interested. 
Herr Nordstrom was pleased with Signor Pagano's interest. Really, he said, it is unbelievable to find something so perfect. What is perfect, Herr Nordstrom? Come, come, we are eager to hear. The cove. What has the cove to do with philosophy? It is perfect. Perfect? This time, Signor Pagano's voice showed nothing but disapproval. Yes, Herr Nordstrom turned away from Signor Pagano and put his arm around Michael's shoulders. Do you remember, Michael, I said that all philosophers search for the truth through knowledge. I was talking about ideas, but ideas or coves, it is all the same. Now, here is a cove, and we want to find out the truth about it. How will we find the truth? Through knowledge. And how will we get the knowledge? By going to the cove. See how simple it is? Simple? Signor Pagano's eyes were flashing. Herr Nordstrom, I'm afraid you don't understand. To go to the cove is impossible. Why? Signor Pagano was really angry now. Why? Why? Herr Nordstrom, all evening you sat with your nose in a book. It takes a brilliant man to read with his eyes and listen with his ears to two different things at the same time. Herr Nordstrom bowed. Thank you, Signor Pagano. It was not intended for a compliment, but I accept it as one. I, Signor Pagano, heard every word you were saying all evening. If you did, you would not stand there asking foolish questions. I do not think my questions are foolish. Why can't I go to the cove? How do you think you are going to get there? I will hire someone to take me. No one will even mention the cove. How can you possibly think that anyone will take you there? Then I shall go by myself. How? In a boat. Where will you get one small enough to enter the cove? I'll buy one. Where? Here on Capri. There are no boats for sale on Capri. Then I'll get a fisherman to sell me one. No one will sell you his boat. Why not? Why should a fisherman sell you his boat? I will pay him well. Signor Pagano laughed. Ha! When you buy a fisherman's boat, Herr Nordstrom, you must buy many things. His boat, the fish he will catch, his love of the sea, the feel of the wind in his face, the excitement, the danger, his pride in the hall. It is a big price, Herr Nordstrom. He could buy himself another boat. Where? Here on Capri. They do not make boats on Capri. In Naples, then. How would he get to Naples? In a boat. What boat? He has no boat now. He has sold it to you. Someone else could take him. Who? A friend of his, another fisherman. And miss a week's fishing? Why should he? I would pay him well. What? You wish to buy two boats, Herr Nordstrom? Two fishermen, two catches, two loves of the sea, two winds, two excitements, two dangers, two prides. You are richer than I thought, Herr Nordstrom. Herr Nordstrom shrugged. All right, all right, then I won't buy a fisherman's boat, but I'll get one some way if I have to go to Naples myself and buy one. You are a fool. Why? With thousands of coves, why do you have to worry about this one? We don't bother the cove. The cove doesn't bother us. It is a good arrangement. But the cove does bother me. I want to find out the truth about it. You are risking your life for something that is not important. It is important to me. Important enough to die for? No one is sure I'm going to die. There is a saying, Herr Nordstrom, where there's smoke, there's fire. When people are afraid of something, there must be a reason. Herr Nordstrom's eyes flashed. I don't believe that. People are afraid of anything they don't understand. When they understand, when they know the truth, they can do something about it. Look at Columbus. Everyone told him he would drop off the edge of the earth if he sailed too far, but he sailed on anyway. If he had listened to that kind of talk, he would never have discovered America. Signor Pagano laughed. Ha! Don't fool yourself, Herr Nordstrom. You'll make no great discovery. You'll find no America in the cove. Columbus wasn't searching for America. He was searching for the truth, the truth about the world.
That may well be true, Herr Nordstrom, but this is true also. I have lived among fishermen and sailors all my life, and I have learned many things. Most important, I've learned this. Fishermen and sailors are not easily fooled. The sea is their life and their death. They know when to have courage and when to be afraid. They have many superstitions. But you can be sure of this. There is a good reason behind every one. You will do well to respect them. I too know a saying, Senor Pagano. It goes like this. Finders keepers, losers weepers. All my life I have tried to find the truth with words. Now I have the chance to find it with action. And I'm not going to lose that chance, Senor Pagano. No matter what happens, I am not going to lose that chance. Then, without another word, Herr Nordstrom left the room. <whistles> Monsieur Jacques gave a low whistle. Signora Pagano crossed herself. May the saints help us. Lord Derby walked back and forth across the room. Too much learning, he muttered to himself. Too little sense. Signor Pagano looked dazed. The longer I live, he said slowly, the less I know. He is the last person in the world I would have expected to cause any trouble. All day he sat buried in his books. He seemed afraid of his own shadow, of his own voice. But now, now! It's all my fault, Papa. It's all my fault, said Michael dolefully. Why, Michael? Why is it your fault? Well, you see, if I hadn't asked him the meaning of philosophy. Signor Pagano gave a short laugh. <laughs> well, Michael, it can't be helped. Who would think that a simple question would set him off like that? Suddenly, he remembered how angry he was. Bah! That young jack and apes going to teach us the meaning of philosophy, is he? Doesn't care how much trouble he stirs up. Doesn't care what happens to anyone. Well, he might learn a thing or two himself. Signor Pagano nodded slowly. Yes, he might learn a thing or two himself before it's all over. And we'll go on with chapter six in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Hey, please reach down, click like, and subscribe to our channel. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.